In today's lesson, we're going to put a few different concepts together that you've learned about throughout the unit and also tie it back in with a very cool and popular analytical chemistry technique, acid-base titration. <coughs> so you would have learned a little bit about acid-base titration in grade 11, and we expand on our knowledge a little bit more on titration in grade 12. If we had a little bit more time and we're actually in class, we'd be doing probably about three or four days of hands-on titration. So I'm sad that we're missing that, but hopefully I can give you some connections to our new concepts and you can take what you learned back in grade 11 and, and use it going forward if you take any uh, post-secondary chemistry. So the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we are comfortable with all the terms with titration. In the lesson folder, there's several extra videos put in there for review. Now, I know it's a little bit more to watch this week, but it would definitely help with your understanding if you did a quick review and watch through them um, with all the setup for titration, with all the equipment and just general concepts. But these are a few words we're gonna use today, so let's make sure everyone knows. So the types of titration we're studying are between an acid, and a base. So first the term neutralization, that's when we've gone to completion with our reaction. There's no more acid, there's no more base. At this point what's left? Salt plus water remain. If you remember acid plus base gives you salt plus water, that neutralization equation. So if you're actually neutralizing your solution, what's left is the salt and water. But if you remember from our last unit, or sorry, our last lesson, um, we figured out that some salts are actually acidic or basic and not just neutral. So we'll come back to what role that salt actually plays in a titration and when you study it, what happens there. So think about pH of salts from our last lesson and we're gonna come back to that shortly. When you hear the word titration, that's where we're basically trying to find out the concentration of an unknown. Now the unknown can be an acid or a base, either one are possible, but to figure out that unknown concentration, you have to use a standard solution. So either a standard acid or a standard base solution. This one, you know the concentration of it. If you remember back in grade 11, you would have made standard solutions in that large volumetric flask. So this is one you can prepare yourself or order, but you definitely know the concentration of it. Next term is called the titrant. This is the solution that you add to the unknown. The titrant here, you know the concentration. This is your standard solution. In high school chemistry, and even in a lot of first year chemistry courses, the titrant is most often a base. The most common one we use in high school would be sodium hydroxide. So in that burette goes your titrant and we most often use sodium hydroxide. If it's helpful, we'll just put a little Reminder here, this one goes in the burette. Then there's two points in the titration that are really important. So when neutralization is reached, that's when we get something called the equivalence point. When the number of moles of hydrogen ions are equal to the number of moles of hydroxide ions. And I'll put down in here neutralization just for reference. We want to stop doing our acid-base reaction right at that equivalence point, right when neutralization has been reached. 
but we can't usually see that with our own eyes because the molecules and ions are tiny and the solutions often are colorless. So this is where the indicator comes in. We need an indicator to change color right when that titration is done. So when you hear the term endpoint, it sounds similar, equivalence point, endpoint, but endpoint is when an indicator changes to its desired color. Last year we used a lot with phenophthalene and our desired endpoint color was that pale pink that we saw. So if you hear endpoint, it's when an indicator changes to a particular color. So I'll write that in there for you. Little example with phenophthalene, just as some reference. Okay, so now that we've done a quick review of some important terms with titration, let's spend a few minutes talking about acid-base indicators. So you've used them, you've seen them before, you probably used a variety of them last year or in grade 10, but what's actually going on with them? You might not have known, most of them are weak acids, and most of them are monoprotic. So remember the term monoprotic means one hydrogen. So weak acids with one hydrogen. And since they're weak acids, this means we have equilibrium happening. So in solution, they exist as an equilibrium system. Now, depending on whether you shift the equilibrium from the acidic form of the indicator to the basic form, that's where you see a color change happen. So down here, this is a generic equation showing the indicator H with the IN. IN is trying to represent the indicator, symbol representing whatever the molecular formula is. With the hydrogen, this is the acidic version in equilibrium. On the other side of the equilibrium, we have the anion without the hydrogen on there. If this is the acid, this is going to be its conjugate base. Now, in an acid-base equilibrium, or with um, acid-base pairs, according to Bronsted-Lowry theory, we know that they're paired up and the only difference between them is the existence of a hydrogen ion or not. With indicators, the presence of that hydrogen ion actually changes the color of the equilibrium from one color to another. So if we had something like phenophthalene, phenophthalene we'll just abbreviate there, in its acidic form is actually what you would find in that dropper bottle. It's clear and it's colorless. But if you use it in a titration and you're adding base from your burette, it's dripping into that flask, you see that flash of pink color. It flashes pink. Why does it do that? Every time you add the base, it gets rid of some of that hydronium ion and it shifts the equilibrium forward to try and replace it. The pink color comes from the deprotonated form of the acid base indicator. Once you add that excess base in there, you get the pink color. First it starts pale pink just as you get rid of all of the a hydronium ion, but if you add too much, it shifts that equilibrium all the way and you get that super dark pink color, which nobody really liked getting in their titration. So this is just one example of an indicator that you've seen, but there are other indicators that will shift between a series of two different colors and depending on the two different colors, there's often a gradient between them. So for phenophthalein, it goes from no color all the way over if you went to the extreme would be dark pink and then it would be a range of very pale pink up to very dark magenta pink. 
When you're doing a titration, how do you know which indicator to use? Well, when you're doing that, the ideal point to stop the titration is at the equivalence point. Remember, this is when you have neutralization. So if you want it to stop when you have neutralization, that point has to be equal or as close as you can to the end point when the indicator changes color. So you want to stop when it's neutralized. You need a visual cue to say, hey, I'm going to stop my titration. So you're going to pick an appropriate indicator and its endpoint so you can visually see when to stop. So what are some other indicators out there? In the back of your textbook on page 747, there is another table very similar to this. Please take a look at it and use it when you're doing some of your homework questions. Um, it's nothing you have to memorize. You would never be expected to memorize ranges, but knowing how to read it is important. So how does it work with this one? You've got a whole bunch of indicators listed down here. On top, you've got the pH scale, and then it's showing you what the color ranges are. So if we look, for example, at phenophthalein, because everyone's kind of familiar with that one, if we look right when that pink color changes, if we kind of scoot it up there to the pH scale, just above eight, let's say 8.2 or 8.3, that's when the pink color starts to appear. So if you have a solution that's less than 8.2 or 8.3, it's gonna be colorless, which is why you don't see that down on the rest of the chart. If it's above 8.2 or 8.3, then the pink color gets more pronounced. And then here it says red, so let's say at about pH of 10, that pinky red mag magenta color, any solution that has a pH greater than 10 will stay that dark red color. It won't change to lighter again, it'll stay that dark color. So that's how this, this table is set up and it's showing you where that transition of colors actually takes place. Now, when you're looking at the rest here, you can see that there's some more gradients. So some of them go from yellow to blue and in between would be a gradient with some green in there. Others have different orders, but they're transitioning between yellow and red. So there's an orange color in there. They're a little bit more, I would say subjective. If you've got an endpoint that falls within that range, which shade of orange is the orange that you're looking for? It can get a little bit tricky but you do your best with it and then you can use some other tools to help uh, figure out your unknown. These are three that are very popular. You'll probably run into these ones at some point if you're taking post-secondary chemistry. Bromo Cresol Green. Its color change at its endpoint transitions from blue to yellow within this pH range. So somewhere between 3.8 and 5.2. Methyl red, super common. It changes color um, from red to yellow within a range of 4.3 to 6.2, so an acidic range. Phenophthalein, we've talked lots about that, colorless to pink from about 8.2 to, to 10. So now what we're gonna take a look at are something called acid-base titration curves. This is a graph that measures pH change versus volume of your titrant. So basically a graph of how the pH changes throughout your titration. We're going to look at some scenarios together, but the graphs are basically set up like this. Down here, you're going to have your volume of your titrant. Often it's in milliliters and it'll say whatever the chemical formula is. So if it's sodium hydroxide, you put it there. And then on your y-axis, it's going to have change in pH, starting from zero all the way up to 14. So wherever it starts on the scale here at volume equals zero, will be the pH of your of your unknown, of whatever you're analyzing 
Now there's a few ways to measure pH if you're doing this during a titration. The best way is to use a pH uh, probe, so a digital pH probe that can record the pH for you as you go along. Um, but you could do this manually. It's a little bit more tedious and painful, to be honest. You could add a little bit of your titrant to your unknown and then stop, record your volume, check the pH with pH paper or even the probe itself, and then add a little bit more volume of your titrant, record that volume, check the pH, and then keep going through that process. So you'd be doing a titration on and off to generate points throughout this curve. That takes a lot more time, but having a digital pH probe attached um, to a recorder that could record some of the pH along the way, like the digital probes that we used in class before, um, that, that would definitely make it a lot easier. So let's look at some different cases of acid-base titrations. We're going to do combinations of strong and weak acids and bases. So first, we're going to look at a strong acid, strong base titration. So what could that mean? Hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. That's going to give us water and a salt, and the salt here will be sodium chloride. If we look at this graph, it says volume of strong base added. So this will be, for example, your sodium hydroxide, and this is in your burette. Over here, we've got pH from 0 to 14. This point here, like we just said, at volume equal to zero, this is the pH of your unknown. This is in your flask. Okay, and here it would be hydrochloric acid if we're sticking with our example. So when we look, it starts off with a really low pH, a pH of one, that would make sense for a strong acid like hydrochloric acid. Then we see this curve. So what it means is we start the titration. Here we start adding some of the base to the flask and the pH is monitored. So after 10 mils of base added, the pH goes up. Add a little bit more the pH goes up and then it increases. That should make sense. If we're adding a base, the pH should rise. At some point, what you'll notice is the pH goes up really fast and all of a sudden it shoots up straight and then it starts to level off. So what's happening in here? It's neutralizing, neutralizing, neutralizing all of the acid. At some point, there's no more acid molecules left and as you add more and more and more base here, it will take on the pH of whatever your basic solution is here. So at the very end of your titration, this will represent the pH of your base. And so if you have a strong base with something like sodium hydroxide, that's sitting close to pH 13, that would make sense because you've got a strong base there. Then we wanna take a look at specifically this region in here. So at one point in the titration, you'll find this curve goes straight, almost even vertical, or it looks like a slope of zero. Mathematically, if we take a look at this curve, it looks like a sigmoidal curve. Right at that inflection point, yes, we're getting into some math here, um, but right at that inflection point, that's where the equivalence point is. That's when neutralization happens. If you have a strong acid and a strong base, the equivalence point is always pH of 7. Now you're probably thinking, why is it pH of 7? Remember, at the equivalence point, it means neutralization. What's at neutralization? Water and salt. So, no acid, no base left. You've got water and salt. 
the salt decides the pH at the equivalence point. And we know sodium chloride, this is a neutral salt. So a neutral salt will result if you have a strong acid or a strong base. And that's why that equivalence point is at a pH of 7. Now, there's one other thing to take a look at on this graph. Um, they're showing two different indicators. Now, it might seem strange to show two here, but we'll see in a couple of diagrams how they're helpful for those ones. But we said we want to choose an indicator that's going to change color at the equivalence point. Neither one of these ones overlap with our equivalence point. You can see pH of 7 here doesn't work for either phenolphthalein or methyl red. So if we were going to choose a good indicator for this titration, we want the end point to be changing color at a pH of 7. So if we go back to this chart that we were looking at earlier, and we look, this is pH of 7 up here, and see when we see a color change, there are two that stand out definitely as good candidates. One of them could be phenol red, because it changes just from yellow to red, so you get an orange hue appearing at pH of 7, so that might give you a visual, hey, orange color, I've got to stop. Or maybe bromothymol blue would also work, because you're kind of getting out of that green color into blue, so that would also give you a visual reference. So for these ones, um, phenol red or bromothymol blue would be good indicators. All right, so now let's take a look at another example of an acid-base titration curve. And we'll point out some of the same features that we saw previously. So weak acid, strong base this time. So a good example would be something like acetic acid. And again, strong base, let's just keep it easy here, sodium hydroxide. We're going to get water and then we'll get sodium acetate as our salt here. Okay, so there's a couple of things that are different about this curves uh, and graph. So let's just take a look at a few of the features. Strong base here. So if you want for reference, this can be sodium hydroxide. In this diagram, there's two curves. The solid one represents the actual weak acid strong base titration. The one in the dashed line here is to reference the curve from strong acid strong base from the previous one. Now, the reason why it's there is it's because the shape of the curve does give you some indications as to what type of titration is actually occurring. So let's come back to that one for a minute, but that's what that curve means. Let's look at where this curve starts. Here's our pH. This would be for acetic acid, our weak acid. This one, our weak acid, the pH is a little bit higher, around 3. That would make sense because less um, hydrogen ions have dissociated in solution. When we take a look at where the curve ends up here, it's got that high pH, pH of about 13. That still references to sodium hydroxide, so that's, that's not anything different. But here are the places where you do see a difference. The shape in the curve is different, and where the equivalence point is, is different. So, you kind of see a bit of a sigmoidal shape down here, then it goes straight up, and then it plateaus out at the top. If we compare that to the shape of the strong acid, strong base curve, you can see it's fairly flat, then it shoots up fairly vertical, and then it goes flat again. It looks more like an S. If you have 
a weak acid or a weak base involved, you have something called a buffer region that shows up. In this buffer region, what's going on is an application of Le Chatelier. Now, if you remember, Le Chatelier's principle is, is looking at how an equilibrium responds to stress. So you've got this weak acid sitting at equilibrium and you're introducing a base. So it's adding a little bit of base and it's increasing the pH, but it's trying to resist the change in pH. It kind of flattens out here. It says, hey, I don't really like this. I want to stay acidic. So it shifts the equilibrium back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you've disrupted it so much that all of a sudden it shoots up straight and then plateaus out. Where you find the equivalence point is still the midway between the most vertical part of your curve. So find the two points um, that show where basically the slope is equal to zero. Here's your inflection point. With this particular example, they're showing a pH of 8.8. .8, but what we need to know is for weak acids and strong bases, the equivalence point is going to be basic. It's going to be greater than seven. The specific value depends on which acid or which base you're using. And that's a next level type of calculation. There are a few in your textbook you can look at, but we are not covering those ones here. But let's take a look at this. So here we've got a basic equivalence point. And that's because you have a basic salt. Our salt here, for as an example, could be sodium acetate. So that sodium acetate, if you were to analyze it using the same principles from our last lesson with hydrolysis of salts, you would find that the acetate ion actually makes the the point at neutralization slightly, slightly basic. And that's why the equivalence point has moved up. Very last part, indicators. So we can see on this graph where the equivalence point is actually overlaps fairly well with phenolphthalein. You can see that where that equivalence point is is right when we go from that colorless to pink solution. So a good indicator for this could be phenolphthalein. Now, had you chosen the other indicator that's shown here, methyl red, its color change or endpoint happens in the buffer region. And that's not a region that we're interested in. We're interested more in the equivalence point right now. To show you something a little bit different, with this example, we're going to look at a weak base and a strong acid, but this time we're flipping things around. What if the acid is your titrant? So down here it says volume of HCl added. This is your titrant. And we're starting with a weak base, which is your unknown. So hallmark weak base example could be something like ammonia very common strong acid, hydrochloric acid. And we get water and we get ammonium chloride here. Okay. So with this example, when we're looking at what's going on, where we start up here, we have a basic pH. This would be the example pH of your weak base. So it could be ammonia. Weak base starting at pH of about 11. Down here, this is going to be after the titration is complete. This is going to show you the pH of your strong acid. You're adding extra, extra, extra acid. At the end, it goes down very low. But what is interesting here is you can see some characteristics that are similar from the previous example. When we had a weak acid, there was a buffer region. Here, with the weak base, there's also a buffer region. 
here you're getting Le Chatelier coming into effect here. That weak base is saying, hey, wait a minute, I don't like to be disturbed, and it's shifting that equilibrium to try and avoid stress. But again, at some point, that's going to fail, and the pH is going to continue to drop as you add the acid, and it drops, 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 and then it flattens out down here. Same kind of idea for finding equivalence point. Look for the two points on your graph where that line is pretty much vertical, no slope. Where is that inflection point right in the middle? That's your equivalence point. What you should notice here is the pH of the equivalence point is in the acidic range. For this specific example, it's saying 5.82. But in general, if you have this combination, it's definitely going to be less than 7 or acidic. Again, why is this happening? This here has to do with the salt that we have. So here at the equivalence point, NH4Cl, our salt is acidic. So if you looked at those two ions separately, like we did with hydrolysis of salt, this one, the ammonium ion, will produce an acidic solution at equivalence. Last part here, indicator. So you can see again, they've shown the same two indicators throughout phenophylline and methyl red. Here you can see phenophylline would not be a good option. Its endpoint, its color change range happens in the buffer region. That doesn't overlap with your equivalence point, which is what you're trying to go for. Here you can see that color change from yellow to orange that happens with methyl red is right at the equivalence point. So that one makes it a good choice. Last part of our lesson, what happens if you have polyprotic acids? All the examples we've seen so far have been with monoprotic. What if your unknown is polyprotic? Remember with polyprotic, there's more than one hydrogen present. So guess what? Every time you remove a hydrogen, it has its own equivalence point. This curve here shows an example of a diprotic acid. And just generic, we'll just call it H2A. There are two dissociation equations down below for each hydrogen. One would have a Ka1, and one would have a Ka2. You can notice in the graph here, there are two curves. This first curve here will have its own equivalence point. So the first equivalence point would have to do with neutralizing that first hydrogen ion. As you continue to perform the titration, you have to neutralize the second hydrogen ion. And guess what? There's going to be another point, another equivalence point, but equivalence point number two. That would belong for the second equation to neutralize that second proton that's there. So would you have to use two different indicators for these? Definitely here they're showing methyl orange working well for the first and phenophylline for the second. But what you wouldn't want to do is have two indicators in your sample at the same time because the colors would just mix together. So if you knew you had a polyprotic acid and you needed multiple indicators, run the titration once with one indicator, figure out that equivalence point, and then repeat it with another um, sample of your unknown with the second indicator and see what that other equivalence point would be and so on. So just to give you an idea, these ones are a lot more difficult to actually calculate with multiple equivalence points, but definitely very cool to visualize when you're doing a titration. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more of idea of some applications of titration. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, and there's also a really cool simulator um, online that you can play around with, change the indicator, change the types of acids and bases, and see how the, the plots change. So I hope you enjoy checking that out um, as part of your homework.